In the book of John, John chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus, in his prayer to his Father, makes this prayer request. And he says here, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me. It is through Christ, through the message of the apostles, that believe in their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you, May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And today I want to talk about the incarnation, communion, and remembrance. And that impact on all of our lives. And our responsibility to try to fulfill Jesus' prayer. That is... Our actively, active involvement in being one in Christ Jesus, allowing the Father to be in us, and to recognize the importance of all of this. What brought this to mind, and the way in which I brought this to mind, is in a conversation I was having with some people last week after church in Modesto, and they were, they were reminiscing about all of the good times that they had had at festivals, at the feasts. Now, for most of us, we have a history of the feast, and it was amazing. They started their stories and said, oh, do you remember when we went to Hawaii and when this person lost their car there and, and because they all had all kinds, of, all had the same car, same color when you went to Hawaii, and this one individual had to wait till everybody took their car and the last one left. And they were laughing and carrying on about that. And they were talking about the food that they had and the friendships they had, all of those things that they thoroughly enjoy about their relationship, about their experiences, memory, the awareness, and the realities that drew them close together. At that moment in time, I wanted to ask a question. I refrained myself from asking a question because it was in the moment. And I wouldn't want to be embarrassing to anyone, but I'm going to ask us this question. How many of you have those kind of stories about feats? Yeah, tell me. Now the question is, how many Jesus stories do you have about what Jesus has done in your life over a period of time? And they, they just pop up just like this. You start one and you go from one to another to another to another. Jesus moments. And how, how much enjoyment you had in communion with Jesus in that relationship with Jesus. And it's like, oh, I remember when, you know, I was lost. I couldn't find anything. And then I found, as the example, I found the car. Couldn't find it till everybody else moved. And then I realized where mine was. Or, oh, I, we had this moment. We just sat down. And the Lord and I had this meal together. I, and I just enjoyed his provision. And, and I have this moment. And I have that moment. And... It was so nice. We just got together. We were family. We were friends. We had all of those things. Because if we don't have a lot of those moments, our communion is not quite what Jesus prayed for. He prayed that we might be one. Because I believe that Jesus and his Father have lots of stories to tell and to share. And lots of love to share one with another. And there are a lot of gifts in that giving of their faith and their confidence in what they were doing. Father, send me. I was willing to go. And, oh, Father, this is a situation when I was hurting in this one. You saved me. You, you, you helped me through those things. I look to you. I got my confidence, your will in my life. It is in that that I think that we, when we think about communion, that we think about Jesus and that relationship. It is not a sterile moment in our life where we take bread and we take wine and we take the body and blood and that's it. And we walk away. If we do not have this relationship with Jesus, you cannot walk away from that kind of encounter and realize what a blessing that we have. 
So, again, it's how many Jesus moments do we have? And as I was thinking about this sermon earlier in the week, I was thinking about songs like, I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. Um, I am thine, O Lord. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to, to the ever, you know, his plan, his purpose. How often that we have stories where Jesus has carried us through on his shoulders. And we were frightened. We, we were like sheep that were being held and carried through difficult. And how often that we have li- laid down in green pastures and, and safe folded we rest because we know that whatever happens, that we have a good shepherd who loves us and is caring for us. So how many meals have we shared with Jesus? Where we're just so very thankful for that. And how many conversations and prayers have we shared? And how many times has He answered us in wonderful and beautiful ways in our life? And how often has Jesus thought of us and how often have we thought of Him? Because you see, without the incarnation, that is, without Jesus coming and being one of us and real and connecting with us in the way that only in the incarnation can He connect with us that God sent His own Son to help us to realize what a connection that we have from beginning to end, from the, the, the inception of Jesus, the conception of Jesus, actually even from the inception where God says, well, this is the way that we're going to do that. And this is the purpose that we have to the conception, the birth of, of our Lord and Savior and His interaction. So the incarnation... The coming of Jesus connects us to God. And Jesus connects us to the Father, as we say, our Father, who who are in heaven. And we have God moments as a result of that. Jesus raises us up into heavenly places, as I mentioned last week in, in the book of Ephesians. It says we are raised up into heavenly places, you know, where we feel inspired and we feel encouraged. And we know that we have a relationship with him. And then we also recognize that Jesus' attitude towards us, which changes so much, where he tells us, you know, I know you believe in God. Believe also in me, because in my Father's house, in his home, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go, and that where I am, you may be also, which is a connection that we have to God. And then the incarnation in human to human. Hebrews 4 tells us that we have a high priest who is touched with every feeling of infirmities that we have, and yet without sin. We have a high priest who knows those situations, and we think about our, our discussions and our communion with the Lord where we, we can be open and honest with him because we already know that he knows it. But he's also sharing with stuff that we don't know about ourselves. And in that openness and that honesty, But there's an incredible freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and that we have a a brother in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes we think and we wonder about ourselves, well, who am I? Who am I? Well, we're nothing except we have a brother whose name is Jesus. And we have a brother because he has declared himself to be our brother. We have a brother because he is human, fully human as we are. Are. And he is fully God. And he has that connection. We have that human experience. And we have a brother that is the Word, which in the beginning was with God and was God. And our brother is full of grace and truth. John chapter 1 and verse 14. For us to understand that. And that we have a brother that models spiritual life. And who's ability to talk to his disciples to people who are sinners who, a brother who's who the prophecy says he came to save sinners we have a brother who is Emmanuel is a God with us that is the communion that we have we have a brother that we love who gives us life and gives us the hope now we've got to think about it, this brother and what he's done for us because it's like unwrapping a gift that you have no idea of its value it's more than a Rubik's Cube. And you keep twisting and keep dipping things. We have a brother. And for us to understand it, we have to ask ourselves this question. What would communion be without Jesus? Now, I, you know, and I'm not picking on our history, the Passover and all of that. But it was, it was sterile in its way. 
We spent six weeks before the Passover trying to get rid of our sins. We came in quiet. Uh, we came in feeling bad, you know, terrible and all of that. And yet we realize that we, in our understanding now, that we have a, a different approach to it. And Jesus helps us to realize that, and the question is, what communion would be like if there was no forgiveness? You ever been, you ever been a sitting at a table, family table, where people are mad at one another and you know they haven't forgiven one another? I tell you, it's a really delightful place not to be. You know, you're, you're eating there, you're choking food down, you're upset stomach, you want to leave, but you're kind of stuck in that environment because you know there is no forgiveness. So imagine what your life would be like, for example, if you knew that you weren't forgiven and you knew the other person wasn't forgiven and you knew also that they had lots of sins. You talk about aggravating, it would not be very much of a communion at all, whatsoever. What if there was no salvation for you? What if I was, instead of communion, I was up here telling you, look, I, could, I really don't believe any of you are converted. Not that you've ever heard that. But I don't believe that you're converted. You know, because your actions do not give any sign that you're converted whatsoever. And you need to do more and do this and do that. Certainly is not a lot of communion in, 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 in that understanding. What if there's no redemption? Oh, yeah. You're impossible. Couldn't buy you back. You know, the, you got all this history, and it's going to stay with you. We're not going to redeem you. And there's no reconciliation. Okay, imagine this: somebody you highly offended, and you spend the rest of your life eating dinner around them, and you know they're looking at you, thinking, "I remember you and what you did to me." And that, there, that there's no communion in that at all. There's no joy. There's no love. There's no peace in that. And what if, well, there's no love. There's no love of God, and there's no gift of God. You see, God gave us, this is the, one of the beauties of God is the perfect gift giver. And when we think about communion, a couple of things we have to bear in mind. In the example when the, the, the people of Israel, People of Jerusalem are asking us, well, asking them, well, show us a sign that you're really who you are. And then they give him a sign. This, if you show us this. And that, what they asked of Jesus was about the manna. Because they were people hungry. It, give us manna. Can you imagine what it would be like in Jerusalem if every day, six days a week, manna came down from heaven and they would have all of that. And Jesus said, well, the manna there. You know, your fathers ate and they died. The true man, I am the true bread of life. I came down from heaven. I am that. So now the question we have to ask ourselves, we think about communion, which is taking of the bread and the wine at communion. How often did the manna come down from heaven? Six days a week for 40 years. Of course, they didn't gather it together twice as much on Friday. Now, even in Jesus' prayer, what does he say to us? Give us this day our daily bread. And who is the bread of life? So when we think about communion with Jesus, there is something going on in every day of our life where we have a communion with God. Oftentimes, most of the time, when I go to bed and as I'm getting ready to go off to sleep, I'm rehearsing in my mind, Lord, these are the things that you've done in my life today. And I'm thankful for it. It is the first thing I begin with prayer and the next day. is Lord, I look back on yesterday and say, thank you for this, this, and this, and the, the things that you did in my life. Your will, how you work things out. And sometimes they may seem insignificant. Kind of like the little piece of bread that we take. But they're not. It shows the love of God in our lives. So we have Jesus, the Emmanuel, who came to save his people from their sins. We also have another thing when we think about communion, this bread of life that is Christ Jesus, is that we love God because he first loved us. This is the beauty of communion that we have. 
long before, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Long before you and I ever existed, there was a prophecy said, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. His, you know, he shall be called Counselor, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. On his shoulders, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Long before you and I ever came in, God had a purpose in mind for us all. That we might have a relationship with him and know him as Father. Jesus as our elder brother, our Lord, our Savior. That was made known to us in prophecies. So Jesus offers the best that he has. God offered the most that he gave. He gave himself. And in, in that, when we see the love of Jesus, we see the, the way that he handled things. And, and I had a kind of awakening. And yesterday I was reading about Jesus and, and Mary Magdalene where he cast out seven demons. And I'm thinking, and then the relationship that they have. I mean, Mary's there at the cross at his crucifixion. She's there, the, you know, on Sunday. She's, she's there on numerous occasions, this woman. But my appreciation was an appreciation for people who have mental health issues. And hers was a spiritual issue, but still it looks a lot alike in a way because she had seven demons that were bothering her and Jesus cleansed her of that. And he had... She obviously she loved him, he loved her, but but so does Jesus love us. And we have our problems and our difficulties. So we have this. He is the true bread of life that we come to appreciate. And Jesus said, You know, if I be lifted up, that, that was speaking of his resurrection, I will draw all men to me. This is the beauty and the understanding. And without the incarnation though. There is no way that we could have this communion. And But the point that Jesus made in the night that he was betrayed, when he took bread and he blessed it, he said, you do this in remembrance of me. And so when I originally started the sermon, it was communion. Remember me? Question mark. Explanation mark. The question mark is, do we really remember him? And if we do, do we remember him for who he really is? And the exclamation part is, remember me because of how awesome and how incredible God is. Now, there's another story that I want us to, to look at, and, and we won't have time to explore it entirely, but I'm going to give it to you very quickly in this regard. On the road to Emmaus, which you're all very familiar with, this is on Sunday because it was the third day. It was, you know, we know it to be on that particular day. These two disciples were walking along, and Jesus joins in their conversation. He says, well, well, why are you looking so down, so forlorn? And then they said, well, where, where have you been, fella? Uh, and this is one of those interesting things about the kind of savior that we have. He's asking a question. He knows all the answers to it. And, and they said, well, you know, this Jesus that we thought he was the Messiah, and he is, he's been crucified, and basically our hope is all gone. It basically is what they're saying. Because we thought, past tense, that he would save us. And then Jesus begins to explain. He starts in Moses and he begins to explain the prophecies. And he says, the prophecies from Moses, he says, everything concerning him. He's beginning to talk about. So imagine walking along and he starts telling them. Well, you know, that prophecy, this Messiah, this, this fellow that you're talking about, a child is born. Could you? I could, I could just imagine Jesus explaining that one. Should not a child be born? Is not God interested in you? Is, is God not a, a glorious, humble God who loves us? Is God not our Father who gives us life? I just imagine Him explaining Isaiah nine six and seven explaining that and did he not speak powerful words that had incredible wisdom you know which would tear you know obviously at their heart in fact they said when he spoke to us when he spoke to us did not our hearts burn within us 
Sometimes, brother, we might flip open the Bible and read the scripture, and we've all made this statement. I've read that a thousand times before, and I never understood it like that. And we say, no. Is that a God event? Is that a Jesus event? And when we do things that just by nature we really don't want to do, we, we might say, it is Christ in me that does that. When we give, and sometimes we may not want to, but this is what we need to do, but this is how we ought to be. And we suffer through things that we don't gripe and bellyache and do all the other things because we know there's a reality in the things that we suffer through. I was just, and, and in that process of reading, which is one of the other things I found interesting, evidently the Jews on the night of the Passover, they would always set aside one chalice of wine with Messiah. It would be interesting, and I'm speculating, it would have been interesting on that evening in which Jesus took the bread and wine if they did not have one of them sitting there. And Jesus reached over and did what nobody else had ever done. Took the Messiah cup and said, here, drink. And here's the bread. It would be interesting because it would you know, tell quite a story that Jesus the Messiah was willing to share. Now, the point that I get to is uh, in Luke chapter 24 and, uh, and verse 35 on the road to Emmaus. It was when Jesus broke bread with them that their eyes were open. And brethren, I say that because it is in communion. The bread and the wine that our eyes are open our eyes are really open to God. And we understand and we can appreciate what God has done. Because you see, God hasn't given just a little bit of himself. He has given his whole self to us. We know and we think about he was made flesh. We think of the bread, you know, becoming his body. We also know in the book of Leviticus it tells us this, that the life is in the blood. The sacrifice that Jesus gave to us in shedding of his blood is for that we might have life. And we have a, a, a good shepherd who said, I am the good shepherd. I have come that you might have life, and you might have life abundantly. Communion without actually loving God, being thankful to God, feeling reconciled, feeling redeemed, knowing that you have salvation. This is who he is. And what he has done. And what our relationship is about. It isn't just, I removed your sins. It is, I love you. This is what I've done. And I want you to know, and I've gone so far as to become one of you. To help you to understand that. And I even, when that event happened, my father's sent a full orchestra to dedicate that. I think about when we dedicated the auditorium in Pasadena. Mr. Armstrong wrote over the Vienna Sympathy, Sym- Sympathy Symphony to dedicate that because it was that important. It was that important that the Father sent a whole host of angels and he revealed it to simple shepherds who, at the name of Jesus, their knees bowed. This is the Lord that we serve. This is the communion that we have. It is a communion of incredible hope, of faith, of joy, and peace. And so we celebrate that. We would not want to miss the incredible event that God had in mind from the beginning, that our Lord would be one of us, We could be one with him. And that Jesus, at the end of the story, in in that human life, would say, Father, may they be one as you and I are one. May they have communion. Because you have to think about what is the relationship between Jesus and the Father? Is it one of us? Well, son, I didn't know if you were going to make it or not. You know, I wasn't sure about that. I've got these doubts, you know. No. It is one of an incredible loving relationship. And that's what we we think about communion, breaking bread, which is communion, the Lord's Supper that we have 
it is one of the things that we rejoice in. So we're going to do that at this particular time. And so the way that I would like to do it is I'm going to uncover the sacraments that we have, the bread and wine. I'm going to ask you to come forward. We ask the blessing. We pass both the bread and the wine to you. And there's grape juice for others that would not. It's on the outside and it's a lot lighter in color. But anyway, that's available to you. So just give me a moment here. Just come forward and just kind of join with me as a family. And we'll ask the blessings on the, the bread and the wine. And I know Miss Clara will be coming here in a moment or so. Oh, okay. There she is. There you go. So please join with me in prayer. Father in heaven, indeed you are a heavenly Father. You have given to us a godly Son, who is our elder brother, and we have life because of him. We have a brother who truly loves us and has demonstrated that love by the, not only Father, by his willingness to be a sacrifice for all of us and the joy that was set before them that he endured the cross, but Father, before, during, and after, he has always demonstrated his love. He is our daily bread. He is our life. He is our hope. And his sacrifice was total and complete. And so we thank you so very much for that. Because, Father, we do have a life. We have salvation in Christ Jesus. We have hope and we have faith. And we experience your love. And you have sent to us the Holy Spirit to reveal even more about your Son, Jesus, and Jesus in turn revealing to you. So now, Father, as Jesus did on that evening, he took the bread and blessed it. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon the bread and each of us as we take it. And then he took the wine and he blessed it as well. As Jesus said, he lives in us. And this is a way, again, he just demonstrates that he does indeed live in us. You know, Mary, he lived in Mary. And he lives in us in this way, through the, the bread and the wine that symbolize the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus, that we have remission of sins, and we can have hope, and we can have life. So we ask this blessing, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to thank all of you for your love for Christ and um, pray that you all experience it. And I don't know, knowing what you experience in terms of the love of Christ is nothing compared to the future. Um, because God so loves us. And it's incredible and it's wonderful. And we thank you very much that you're willing to love him back because he first loved us. And he continues to love us. So to our Lord, the, the bread, who is one of us, flesh and blood, holy God, holy human, thank you for being one of us and being our heavenly high priest. To the our Lord Jesus, amen. And to our Lord, who gave his life so that you and I might have life, because in the blood is life. He has cleansed us from all of our sins, and we stand before him, and he proclaims us holy and blameless in his sight, which is what is most important, and he declares that to the Father as well. To our Lord Jesus, thank you for cleansing us of our sins. Amen. And again, thank you. And may Feeling the blues today or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.